The Facts of Growth, Chapter 10. Over long periods, fluctuations in output are dwarfed by growth, which is the steady increase of aggregate output over time. Chapter 10 Outline, The Facts of Growth, 10-1, Measuring the Standard of Living, 10-2, Growth in Rich Countries Since 1950, 10-3, a broader look across time and space. 10-4, thinking about growth, a primer. Growth is the steady increase in aggregate output over time. We now shift our focus from economic fluctuations and the determination of output in the short and medium run to growth and the determination of output in the long run. By long run, we mean over decades or over half a century or more. Figure 10-1 illustrates U.S. real GDP since 1890. Panel A shows the enormous increase in U.S. output since 1890 by a factor of 46. Note that the vertical scale is a logarithmic scale. The characteristic for logarithmic scale is that the same proportional increase in a variable is represented by the same distance on the vertical axis. Figure 10-1, panel B illustrates US GDP per person since 1890. It shows that the increase in output is not simply the result of large increase in U.S. population from 63 million to more than 300 million over this period. Output per person has risen by a factor of 9. Ten one measuring the standard of living. We care about growth because we care about the standard of living. Output per person rather than output itself is the variable we compare over time or across countries. We need to correct for variations in exchange rates and systematic differences in prices across countries. Food and essential services tend to be cheaper in poorer countries. When comparing the standard of living across countries, we use purchasing power parity PPP numbers which adjust the numbers for the purchasing power of different countries. Essentially, a common set of prices is used to calculate the GDP per person for different countries. The right measure on the production side is output per worker or output per hour worked. Ten two growth in rich countries since nineteen fifty. Table 10-1 shows the evolution of output per person in four rich countries since 1950. It shows that there has been a large increase in output per person, GDP divided by population measured at PPP prices, in all four countries. In Japan, it increased 11.3 times, in France, 4.6 times, and in the U.S., 3.3 times its level in 1950 due in part to the force of compounding. There has been a convergence of output per person across countries. Countries that were behind have grown faster, such as Japan, thus reducing the gap between them and the United States. Figure 10-2 shows growth rate of GDP per person since 1950 versus GDP per person in 1950 for OECD countries. It shows that countries with lower levels of output per person in 1950, such as Japan, Greece, and Germany, have typically grown faster. Focus. Does money lead to happiness? Answer. Qualified. Yes. In relatively poorer countries, Happiness tended to be higher the higher the level of income per person. In rich countries, there appeared little relation between income per person and happiness. This is what was observed by Richard Easterlin, who was one of the first economists to look systematically at the evidence. This is known as the Easterlin paradox. Once basic needs are satisfied, higher income per person does not increase happiness and the level of income relative to others rather than the absolute level of income matters.
So if this interpretation is correct, it has major implications for the way we think about the world and about economic policies. In rich countries, policies aimed at increasing income per person might be misdirected because what matters is the distribution of income rather than its average level. Figure 1 shows life satisfaction and income per person as determined on the basis of more recent data sets by Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, and it seems to show that increase in income does increase happiness. This goes against the Easterlin paradox. However, the debate goes on. The evidence on the relation between happiness and income per person over time within a country is not as clear as the evidence across countries or across individuals presented in Figure 1. Angus Deaton and Daniel Kahneman have also raised the issue of distinguishing between emotional well-being and life satisfaction in deciding which measure will be used to judge happiness because emotional well-being is positively related to income per person till income reaches $75,000 but not after that. Deaton and Kahneman conclude that high income buys life satisfaction but does not necessarily buy happiness. Ten three, a broader look across time and space. Has output per person in the currently rich economies always grown at rates similar to the growth rates in Table ten one shown on slide eight? The answer is no. From the end of the Roman Empire, four seventy six CE to roughly year fifteen hundred, Europe was in a Malthusian trap or Malthusian era with stagnation of output per person because most workers were in agriculture with little technological progress. After 1500, growth of output per person turned positive but was still small. Between 1820 and 1950, U.S. growth was still 1.5% per year. Sustained growth was high since 1950, showing that it is definitely a recent phenomenon. 10-3. A broader look across time and space. Figure 10-3 shows growth rate of GDP per person since 1960 versus GDP per person in 1960, 2005 dollars for 85 countries. There is no clear relation between the growth rate of output since 1960 and the level of output per person in 1960. This shows that output per person has not converged in all countries like we saw earlier for the OECD countries. 10-3. A broader look across time and space. For the OECD countries, there is clear evidence of convergence. Convergence is also visible for many Asian countries, especially for those with high growth rates called the Four Tigers, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea. Most African countries were very poor in 1960, and some of them had negative growth of output per person between 1960 and 2011, due in part to internal or external conflicts. 10-4. Thinking about growth. An introduction. To think about growth, economists use a framework originally developed by Robert Solow from MIT in the late 1950s. The aggregate production function is a specification of the relation between aggregate output and the inputs in production. Equation 10.1 gives us the aggregate production function where output y is a function f of capital K, the sum of all machines, plants, and buildings in the economy, and labor N, number of workers in the economy. The function F depends on the state of technology. This determines how much output can be produced for given quantities of labor and capital. A country with more advanced technology will produce more output from the same quantities of capital and labor than an economy with a primitive technology. Equation 10.2 says, if both capital and labor are increased by a factor x, 
and output increases by the same factor, then the economy is experiencing constant returns to scale. If only one input, say capital, is increased, then the same increase in capital will lead to smaller and smaller increases in output as the level of capital increases. We refer to this property that increases in capital lead to smaller and smaller increases in output as decreasing returns to capital. Similarly, increases in labor given capital lead to smaller and smaller increases in output showing decreasing returns to labor. Ten dash four thinking about growth, a primer output per worker and capital per worker. The production function and constant returns to scale imply a simple relation between output per worker, y over n, and capital per worker, k over n. If we put x equal to 1 over n in equation 10.2, we get equation 10.3, which shows that output per worker is a function of capital per worker. Increases in capital per worker lead to movements along the production function. This is shown on next slide. Improvements in the state of technology lead to upward shifts of the production function. This is shown on slide 17. So now we can talk about the sources of growth. There are two sources under the assumption of constant returns to scale. Growth comes from capital accumulation due to a higher saving rate and technological progress due to the improvement in the state of technology. Figure 10-4 shows the relation between output per worker and capital per worker. Output per worker is measured on the vertical axis and capital per worker is measured on the horizontal axis. The relation between the two is given by the upward sloping curve. As capital per worker increases, so does output per worker. This is shown by movements along the curve. The shape of the aggregate production function depicts decreasing returns to capital. Increases in capital per worker lead to smaller and smaller increases in output per worker. At point A, where capital per worker is low, an increase in capital per worker, represented by the distance AB, leads to increase in output per worker by the vertical distance shown by the distance A prime B prime. At point C, where capital per worker is higher, increase in capital per worker of the same amount, CD equal to AB, leads to smaller increase in output per worker shown by the vertical distance C prime D prime. Ten dash four, thinking about growth, a primer. Figure ten dash five shows the effects of an improvement in the state of technology. An improvement in technology shifts the production function up, leading to an increase in output per worker for a given level of capital per worker, such as at point A. Summary: one, capital accumulation by itself cannot permanently sustain growth of output per person because of decreasing returns to capital. A steady increase in output per worker will require larger and larger increases in capital per worker. At some stage, the economy will be unwilling or unable to save and invest enough to further increase capital. At this stage, output per worker will stop growing. Nevertheless, how much a country saves is important because the saving rate determines the level of output per person, if not its growth rate. Two, sustained growth of output per person is ultimately due to technological progress. Perhaps the most important question in growth theory is what the determinants of technological progress are.